Which war did you serve in? The Vietnamese uh, War. Vietnam. What was your branch of service? Army. And what was your highest rank? Uh, spec 5. Specialist 5th class. Jim, what general locations did you serve in? From the date I was inducted? Yeah. Well, I went through basic training in Fort Dix, New Jersey. And then I went to uh, the Army Intelligence School, which, again, jokingly is an oxymoron, but uh, <laughs> down at Fort Holabird in, uh, in Maryland. And then, since I had graduated from law school and was drafted in 67, uh, I wound up at CID School, Criminal Investigation, down at uh, Fort Gordon in Augusta, Georgia. Um, CID is mostly, or at that time, was all career people. Uh, with the war going on in Vietnam and with the number of troops in Vietnam, uh, lawyers were allowed to uh, go through CID school and become CID agents. So that's where I wound up. And then I wound up in Vietnam. Where in Vietnam? Oh, uh, Pleiku, up in the Central Highlands. The base itself, it was the 4th Infantry Division. And uh, the name of the division base camp was Camp Anari, E-N-A-R-I like I said, up in the Central Highlands. Jim, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. And where were you living at the time? In uh, Torrington, Connecticut. Can you call the date? Uh, no, I around September of uh, 69. 69? Yeah, I'm sorry, 67. 67? I yeah, I was discharged in September of 69. Now, you were drafted because you know, we had a draft at the time and you had graduated so you no longer had a college deferment? Yeah. So you were actually a lawyer? Yeah. Yeah, I passed the bar in August and there were three of us from Torrington. Three uh, lawyers? Yeah. Uh, who got drafted? Uh -huh. We were deferred because we were in law school and coincidentally Two of my friends from Torrington wound up getting drafted ahead of me. Uh, I'm I won't mention their names, but uh, one eventually wound up in Korea. The other one wound up down in Panama, and I wound up in Vietnam. <laughs> the, the interesting part is that since I was out of law school and had passed the bar, I applied for a JAG commission, and I went through basic training at Fort Dix with the company commander, a lieutenant younger than me, knowing that I could very well be a captain before I finished my, my basic training. So I, I had it sort of easy. <laughs> My commission came through at about a week, a week to 10 days before basic training was completed. And they offered me five years on the commission. So I turned it down and I said, you know, I'm not interested in five years. So then I had to pay hell for the next 10 days. But, uh, that's, well, because you had applied for the JAG position, what was your basic training like? Did you did you get exempt from all the stuff the other guys? Were no, doing? no, they they, uh, you know, they looked the other way on a lot of things. Uh, I can still remember going down to Fort Dix in whether it was September or October. It was a cold fall, and we had probably two snowstorms during my time in basic training. And without exaggeration, one of the sergeants would come around at two in the morning, make everybody get up, get dressed, and grab your entrenching tools, and you'd have to go out and shovel the exercise area with an entrenching tool. 
I did that, I think, once, and then I just said, I'm not getting up. It's, uh, so I didn't. They didn't bother me. So it was, uh, again, until the last uh, 10 days, week or so, and then the lieutenant was looking for me all the time. But uh, <laughs> So when you knew, though, by turning down your commission as a JAG, you'd probably be going to Vietnam? Uh, no, you didn't know. I mean, as I said, the other two, yeah. my two buddies, one wound up in Korea and one wound up in uh, Panama. So you really didn't know. So you were taking uh, chances. Yeah. After you graduated from basic training, did you get leave or were you sent immediately to Vietnam? No, I probably had, and I'll just give you probably 10 days leave, went home, I was married at the time, went home for 10 days, and then down at Fort Halliburg, you could bring a car down. So I had I had my car down at Fort Halliburg. How long were you at Fort Halliburg? Oh, 10, 12 weeks, maybe. And what training did you get there? Uh, intelligence analyst. Was that, did you choose then to be an intelligence analyst, or did the Army choose that? The Army you? chose it, yeah. You could slant what you would go into by knowing how to fill out applications or whatever. Uh, I'll harken back to basic training. Again, one of my buddies who had gone through basic before me told me two good tips. One is when they ask, can anybody here drive a truck, a deuce and a half or a five ton truck, you raise your hand because that means <laughs> If there are three or four guys who can drive a truck, you'll be driving the troops out to the shooting range or out to this range or whatever, and you ride and you drive the truck. And the other thing he said, what your last day of basic when you're turning your weapon in, back then it was an M14, they'll get you up at six in the morning and they will make you clean that M14 till four in the afternoon. It doesn't matter how well you clean it. It doesn't matter how many times you break it down and put it back together. They're not going to give you an okay until four o'clock. So I just went back to the barracks and sat around. <laughs> four o'clock, took my rifle down, and that was it. It was fine. So, so little tips like that when you had somebody going through basic just ahead of you. What kinds of things did they train you at Fort Halliburton? Be an intelligence analyst. Oh, I'm trying to recall. There was map reading. There was uh, understanding the Vietnamese or whatever troop uh, strengths. Uh, mainly, as I recall, I never really went into the field other than going to the school there, but. Uh, in Vietnam, even though I was with an MP company in CID, we had an intelligence uh, company at the same base camp. So I ran into a lot of guys that uh, I had been with at, at Fort Halliburton. They were probably ahead of me by two, three months, but nonetheless, I'd run into them. But uh, I guess they'd look at photographs, aerial surveillance photographs, reports from some of the ground troops on what the enemy was doing, troop movements, that type of thing. From Fort Halliburg, where did you go? I went down to Fort Gordon to uh, the CID school. Do you recall how long that was? Oh, I think it was 12, 14 weeks. It uh, I was able to get into class going down from Connecticut. I bummed a ride on an Air Force plane, I think out of Otis. And one of the engines caught on fire. So we had to make an emergency landing. And I stayed a couple nights, I think in Orlando. And I had to get a way to find a way to get back up into Georgia to uh, Fort Gordon but I was late coming in. I was like four or five days late 
with a class that was starting on such and such a date. But I went in and it was a captain, it was the commanding officer. And you know, I told him, I, I'm a lawyer, I think I can catch up on. So he let me sneak into the class, even though I was, I missed the first five days of it, so. What kinds of things did they teach you at CID school? Uh, CID, you're basically a detective. We were assigned to uh, an MP company. We probably had oh, 130 or so MPs. Uh, the commanding officer was a, a full bird colonel. And we had other officers who were all MPs. CID, there were only three of us. Uh, our commander, I guess, who was a chief warrant officer, and then there was another warrant officer, and then myself as a, well, I started off as a spec four, but as a spec five, but anything to do with solving crimes. Uh, the school was interesting, it really was. Um, but your typical, how to investigate a crime, how to write a report, how to catch the bad guys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but there were only three of you in the class? Wow. No, three of us when I wound up in Vietnam. Three of us with the division. The class itself at Fort Gordon, we had mostly Army. Uh, there were three or four guys from the Navy. Uh, there were some foreign students. And I think there was one female from the Air Force. So it was a mixed bag, and uh, I was at Fort Gordon July, August, September of 68, and then I went to Nam in September. But some of my, we were in barracks, uh, the barracks were nice, but it was hot in, in, in fact, it was hotter in Augusta, Georgia than it was in Vietnam. I was up in the Central Highlands, probably 6,000 feet in elevation at our base camp. So it was, it got cool at night, contrasted with down around Saigon and down in the Delta and the rest of it. But one of my, one of my buddies uh, from Fort Gordon wound up in Korea. Another one, Bill Buck, he wound up down in Saigon, uh, never had a jungle fatigue uniform on. He wore civilian clothes, drove a, I think I, I went down to see him a couple of times, but uh, drove a Plymouth sedan, carried a Thompson <laughs> submachine gun, and lived in what was a former hotel in uh, Saigon with a few other CID agents and about 30 Australian nurses in what was a, a converted hotel. So he had it nice. I was up in the boondocks and the rest of it, but. When you graduated from CID school, did they ship you immediately to Vietnam? No, I went home for, again, a couple weeks. And then you shipped out, uh, where did you arrive in Vietnam? Oh, uh, I think I flew, I think I flew from Hartford to uh, Oakland, to the Oakland Army Base. And then they flew us into Vietnam. I think we flew into either Nha Trang or Cameron Bay. But you flew in on a, on a civilian airliner with stewardesses. There were no stewards back then, or they were all stewardesses. But you had meals, you had drinks, and all the rest. And you got off the plane, uh, and the smell just hit you of, of the Orient. It was, just, and, and that's the smell that's there all the time, I guess. But, so I, I got in country in about, like I said, about September. After you landed, where did you go? Oh. Uh, now, were you flown in as an individual, or did you go with a unit? Individual. So you were arrived in there by yourself? Uh, yeah. Where were you supposed to report? Uh, to the 4th Infantry Division. 
up at Campanari. So you immediately went up to the fort. I think I think I stayed two or three days in uh, in either Cameron Bay or, or or no maybe it was Tonsonut Air Base I think as I think back. Um, but it was funny when I was at Fort Halliburton. I got to know one of the officers who was also a lawyer who had been drafted. I don't remember if he was a first lieutenant or a captain, but anyways, I had a layover there in Fort Halliburton, so I was working in the JAG office doing tax returns for people who were this, that, and the rest of it. But he made me an acting sergeant, so I had sergeant stripes on. And when I went to Nam with my sergeant stripes on, getting off the plane, one of the higher up sergeants, sergeant, march these guys to this. I didn't know how to march anybody anywhere. <laughs> I just said, hey, you guys follow me. And we just walked over to, I guess, some transit barracks where, where we stayed for two or three days. And then I got on a C-130 and flew up to, uh, up to play cool. There's an air base up there, so. And then Did I you spend your whole time then at Play Coup at the. Um... Yeah. Yep. Once you arrived at the base, what was your duties? At first, it was just general CID duties, investigating crimes, crimes between or amongst American troops crimes by Americans against the local population. Uh, we were up in that area where the Mountain Yard tribes were fighting with us on our side. Small people, very good fighters, very honest people. The Vietnamese, you know, mixed emotions about who was who, but or who was on your side. But, uh, and then the drug, um, I don't know the technical, one of the cannabis uh, marijuana plants grows wild in Vietnam. So you had marijuana all over. And after about six months, the commanding general got the idea that CID ought to invest, or not investigate, but ought to uh, instruct the, the troops on the dangers of different drugs and all the rest. And at, by that time, there was a lot of, uh, well, there was always opium. I mean, the, the troops could get opium where, from little kids. I mean, it was that readily available. But So I was sent out to every unit in the division for about three or four months. I had my own helicopter, well, not my, not my own, but I had a helicopter assigned to me. And I would fly, first of all, I went in and lectured the uh, the generals, four or five different generals. Then I went to brigade head headquarters or regiment, then down to company level. And a couple times I can remember flying in on a, the helicopter was a little loach, they called it, a little two-man chopper, glass bubble in the front. And I can remember flying into a company level uh, group, 120 men, 140 men, getting off the chopper with my little kit that had all samples of different drugs and all the rest. Um, and a lieutenant coming up to me and welcoming me, shaking my hand, smoking a marijuana cigarette. And I just, introduce myself and lieutenant you better put that joint out oh i'm sorry sir i'm sorry a couple of times i got caught out there not being prepared to stay overnight and i'd land and say okay get everybody together here's what we're going to do for an hour we're not doing anything for an hour we're moving out in two minutes where am i supposed to go <laughs> call for your helicopter so a couple of times I just wound up going off with the infantry and having to stay, you know, having to borrow a poncho or whatever and, and sleep overnight. But, uh, but again, there were all, all kinds of crimes were 
just like in the civilian population. What was the most common crimes that you investigated? Assaults. Uh, we had what we called donut dollies at our base. They were usually all right, but nobody bothered them. But uh, uh, sexual assaults on Native women, whether they were Vietnamese or mountain yards. Uh, a lot of drug, a lot of crimes involving drugs. Um, and we'd have to pick up the evidence from the company commander who called in that he caught these guys doing this or these or whatever. But one time we had a big, the 4th Division base camp was probably at any given time 4,000, 5,000 people were at, stationed at the base camp. Some coming and going, some there permanent. Like, in one sense, I was there permanently. But someone burned down the PX one night. And, and we had not a lot, but we'd have what they called fraggings, where disgruntled uh, troops would throw a grenade into usually your non-commissioned officers, your sergeants and that kill a couple guys. We had some suicides, but we solved the uh, burning of the PX. We checked back, back then, CID, which is comparable to NCIS on, on TV, although much cruder. We didn't have the uh, computers and this, that, and all the rest, but we checked on anybody in the 4th Infantry Division, literally anybody who had been questioned or a suspect in a previous arson, either in the United States or in Vietnam or, or anywhere. And we ran it down to about four or five different individuals. And uh, I still, I think it was a sergeant. We uh, went over to invest, I and an MP, myself and an MP, went over, and in talking to him, I noticed under his cot that there were cans of tomato sauce. <laughs> and the only place you could get those was at the, at the PX, but they weren't sold to the public. They were there in storage for use in the mess halls and the mess tent and all the rest. So we said, Sergeant Blank, where did you get those cans of tomato sauce. Oh, I had him. I got him here. I bought him or whatever. So it was him. We, uh, we arrested him, interrogated him, and, and he owned up to it. So, uh, so now when you do ship him back to the United States? No, you go down to LBJ. Long been jail in, uh, uh, down in Saigon. Um, the interesting part was that since I had gone through intelligence school, I had a top secret clearance. And nobody else in the MP company had that clearance. So at times, the colonel would send me down on a mission to Saigon to do this or that because I had the clearance and I could carry a briefcase or carry whatever papers had to go down. So it worked out. Can you recall any other memorable cases that you worked on? Oh, like I said, a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, drug cases, uh, probably investigated three or four suicides. Um, These were American soldiers? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And again, unlike what you'll see on, on TV or wherever, over there a suicide was not really investigated. You went and talked to one or two of the people who found the individual commanding officer or fellow troops or whatever. You viewed the body and that was it. Uh, I did have to, if there was a murder involved, sit in on the autopsy, which is as gruesome as, yeah, as it, <laughs> as it is on TV. But uh, what we do, you just pour some aftershave lotion in your handkerchief and were there many murders? 
Eh, one a month, maybe. Who, who murdering who? Troops. Well, there were, again, um, you'd have troops go AWOL, so we'd have to go in with the MPs into uh, into Pleiku, which was a city of, when I say city, uh, dirt streets, uh, open sewage trenches along the streets, uh, people using the open sewage, this men and women and children, right in the open, and the smell was just unbelievable. But uh, probably that many, two a month maybe. But again, you had 12, 14,000 people in the, in the division itself, so. Now, were you responsible for investigating crimes in the whole division? Yes. So you, you would, uh, normally you'd stay at play too, but how often would you go out to other locations? A lot. Uh, the MPs used to run what we called uh, V100s. They were an armored vehicle with rubber tires so they could, when, when our country became involved, we paved a lot of the roads out there, believe it or not. Uh, at Campanari, we had electricity but we had no running water. Um, but the MPs would run the convoys with the V100s, which were an armored vehicle with rubber tires so they could go on the road. The tanks couldn't or your track vehicles couldn't. But uh, you'd probably have two V100s out in front, two bringing up the rear of the convoy. And in fact, in the slides that I I'm letting you borrow. I've got some pictures of the V100s and the rest. And some of the MPs were, they probably done two tours or three tours in Vietnam. They loved it. I mean, they loved to shoot. You had twin uh, M60 machine guns in the turret of the V100. These guys, if I was with them, I'd say, hey, I don't want to go up there. You know, there's RPGs and all the rest, but nope, they'd zip right up there. And some of them, after they got out and couldn't do any more tours in Vietnam, told me they were going into the mercenary business and going to Africa or South America to fight for money. Uh, but uh, but it was it was interesting, it really was. When you went to other locations outside of base, did you usually go alone? Yeah, yes, uh, ninety nine percent of the time. So how many months were you in Pleiku? My, I was there about a year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I probably came home uh, a few weeks early, but. Uh, so what would be a typical day for you from when you get up to when you go to bed? Well, seven days a week. Again, I was I was not even though I was attached to an infantry company or an infantry uh, division, the MP company was separate. We had our own MP club because they didn't want the MPs going out mixing with the troops and the rest of it. But, uh, you know, you, you do some paperwork. We had phones, we had a desk, we had, uh, like I said, we did have uh, electricity. The, uh, the showers were improvised they, somebody, the engineers or someone, rigged up 55-gallon drums above the roof of a, a, a shed, so to speak, and they had kerosene heaters, so the trucks would pump water up into the tanks, and then you'd have hot, I mean, it was hot water, it wasn't uh, warm, but uh, so you, you got by with that. And like I said, we, I don't think we had TV, or maybe we did have TV. Yeah, because I had to go on TV a couple times. I was interviewed about what was going on and this, that, and uh, it was Vietnamese TV or? No, local uh, army TV. Yeah. Wow. You know, it wasn't Robin Williams' Wake Up Vietnam, but it was, uh, I can still remember doing that a couple times. So... 
So well, seven days a week, your basic nine to five, or? Uh, yeah, that, that was basically it. Again, we were at a base camp. When I go out and quote into the field, either in a V100 or a Jeep, I had my own Jeep also, my own, assigned to me. But uh, uh, riding in a chopper was a little bit scary because you were getting shot at a lot, so you'd sit on your helmet and so on and so forth. Now, again, I'm not comparing what I did to the infantry. No comparison. I mean, it's uh, in one sense, I was, I had a good life there and all the rest of it. But uh, uh, it was interesting. In the winter, um, I'm trying to think when the monsoon season started over there. It starts at different times depending on where you are and the rest of it. But it started off. We didn't have rain in the Central Highlands for, let's say, four or five months, not a drop. And one day, whether it was June, July, August, it would rain for half an hour. The next day, half an hour. Then it would rain for an hour. Then it would rain for two hours. Once you got into it, it... It would rain every day, 24 hours a day, for maybe three or four weeks. And now the guys out in the boondocks obviously had to put up with that. But even us at base camp, you'd have the mountain yard women come in and they'd wash your uniforms, your fatigues by hand. And then they would go into the bunkers. Uh, we had sandbag bunkers and light charcoal fires and dry your clothes. That's the only way they would dry. So you'd get your uniform back and it uh, smelled like charcoal, but at least they were clean, contrasted with, you know, the guys out, out in the jungle. But When you were flying around or visiting all these other places, were you ever in combat? Uh, shot at, you mean, or shot at, yes. Face-to-face, uh, -face, hand to hand combat, no. Uh, one of the majors, uh, we had a full bird colonel, like I said, as the commanding officer of the uh, MP company. In fact, he was a provost marshal, I think. But there was one major from Texas, real nice guy. And we get attacks out on the perimeter once, once a week, maybe. Sometimes it was a cow, sometimes it was a tiger, a Bengal tiger. Uh, and other times it was North Vietnamese or Viet Cong trying to infiltrate. But the major would always come to my tent and say, Jim, there's somebody coming in out on that sector. Let's go out there. So <laughs> we would. And we'd get in the bunker with the infantry and the rest and fire off a few rounds, but uh, I forget the major, and like I said, he was a nice guy. I think he played football at Texas A&M, but, uh, but yeah, but as far as the, uh, you know, yeah. How many were in the MP company? How large of a group did you have? Probably 120. And you were... Were isolated, stayed by yourself? Yeah, yep, yep. Like I said, we had our own, our own MP company, uh, MP company club, and the officers and enlisted men would be in there uh, because we were all involved with the MP company. But uh, you yeah, know, did yeah. the officers and the enlisted men get along. In in our group, fine. In our group, fine. Uh, we never had any internal trouble. Uh, the colonel was a nuisance, but um, he was a lifer, so. <laughs> Jim, were you awarded any medals or citations? Yeah, the typical um, Vietnam service 
medals, the yellow and green ribbon. But I got two, well, actually it's called the bronze star with oak leaf, oak leaf clusters. Two of those for, not for valor. Uh, you can get a bronze star for valor or for meritorious service, for doing a good job. You got two bronze stars for, yeah. for meritorious service? Yeah, yep. Uh, unlike a silver star, it's always for valor, period. So if you get a silver star, that's big time, and, and, uh, as are the other medals, obviously. But. Jim, while you were in Plato, how did you stay in touch with your family? Male, basically male. Were you a good letter writer? Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed writing. In fact, my mother, before she passed away, kept all the letters that I'd sent to her. Still I still them? have those, yeah. I think I do. Uh, let me check. My, I was divorced years ago, but uh, I don't know if my present wife threw them away, <laughs> whatever, but yeah. And then I did have letters from other guys who were with me in uh, basic training or CID school. In fact, one of the lawyers from Torrington came across about, he was in Korea, and he sent me about 10 or 12 letters. Uh that I had sent to him when he was in Korea, I think I threw those away. But it's, uh, but so again. the mail service was pretty good, regular? I'm sorry? The mail service was Yeah, good. very good. You didn't have to pay for stamps. Uh, oh, you asked about interesting cases. Um, we used, the Americans used what was called MPC. Military, MPC, military, but it was fake money, same denomination, but it was smaller bills. I probably still have some of those, but the troops who would go into town into play coup if they weren't out in the field would spend that money, and most of your merchants in play coup were Indians. India Indians, and you could buy anything from drugs to women to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the troops would spend the, even though they weren't supposed to, they would spend the MPCs in town. And all those vendors would accept that military insurance? Oh, absolutely, because they could convert that into greenbacks. So probably once every two or three months, we closed the camp down. Nobody could come, come in or out. The MPs would go into town and I would ride with some MPs and the rest. And we'd notify any GIs in town that you had to stay out here. You can come in tonight and turn in your MPCs and get new, with same denomination as American money. One dollar bills, uh, five dollar bills, etc. But the I can remember on a number of occasions riding in a jeep with an MP driving me. <laughs> Indians coming out with literally hundreds of thousands of dollars and asking you for your hat or your helmet, and they give you. A hundred thousand dollars for your helmet. I mean, or whatever you had that a pack of cigarettes, or I didn't smoke, but uh, of course, we didn't. Uh, another trick was that I'm trying to think how it worked. Oh, the greenbacks. Okay. You could send home, they weren't as strict on the enlisted people, the army wasn't as on the officers. But you could send back home, uh, say you won a couple hundred dollars gambling. You could go into a, one of the offices on, on the base camp. And if you had $200 in MPCs, they would give you a money order or whatever, a certificate. And even some of the MPs used to do this. Say you had $500. 
you'd send it home to your wife, $500. She would then go to a bank and get five $100 bills, greenbacks, send them back to the person, the soldier. You could go into town with those and double your money. And some guys had a racket going, literally turning over thousands of dollars just by having their wives or friends or relatives send them the greenbacks. Because the Indians, if you had a $100 bill, you could get $200 in MPC. So if you had a $500 bill, you'd have 1000 Cash. Then you go cash the thousand, send that home. And we caught a few of them. You know, we had to take care of it. But uh, but that was a, a racket that was, was going on quite a bit. So, What was the food like? Did you have a, a mess hall and three meals a day? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my best friends, in fact, he, until he became manager of the MP club, uh, he was in the, the tent with me. I think there were four guys to a, when I say a tent, it was tent on the side with a tin roof, but, uh, and then sandbags all around it. But, uh, after about two or three months, he became manager of the MP club and he could get, be like on mash. You go up to the air force base with a pair of combat boots. No, you can get a case of lobsters or you'd go here and you'd get a case of whiskey or a case of beer or whatever. So I usually ate at the MP club and had steak or whatever. But in some of the, some of the pictures too, you'll see, uh, I've noted who it is. Artie would be the manager and the rest. So if you do look at those slides, you'll, you'll find some interesting ones there. Did you always have a sufficient amount of supplies, clothing, materials, anything you needed? Yeah, we did. We did. No uh, shortages. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, there was a lot of publicity here when we first got involved in the, in the Middle East with, with the roadside bombings, the UDTs, whatever. And Jeeps were never made to be bulletproof or explosive proof. Uh, a Jeep is a Jeep, and that's what we drove. The armored vehicles, the tanks, the V-100, something else. But over in the Middle East, you know, people were decrying the fact that, well, our troops aren't protected, and the Army doesn't care, the government doesn't care. It's, you know, you can only make a bulletproof vest so bulletproof. It's not going to stop a 50 caliber round. It may stop a pistol, a 9 millimeter, whatever. But uh, over there, we didn't have roadside bombings. I, I don't recall one. You'd get mortar attacks, machine guns, RPGs. And along the main highways from our base camp to play cool and then to the various brigade or regimental headquarters, you'd have tanks stationed every mile or so. And the tankers would live in their tank for weeks on end. What they would do is to stop the RPGs, they would put in steel posts and then put two layers of uh, anchor chain link fence. So if this table were the uh, tank, was the tank, you'd have, and the RPGs would hit. And the same RPGs they're using over uh, in Iran and Afghanistan. They were used back then, Chinese, probably, or Russian. Um, but uh, I still recall that. Jim, did you do anything special for good luck? Prayed. <laughs> but again, I... I I keep uh, being redundant on, uh, I was not out as an infantryman, so I had it lucky compared to, compared to most of the guys. 
What did people do to entertain themselves when you weren't working? One day a week we would have a barbecue. Uh, and I don't recall if it was Saturday or Sunday. It was probably one or the other. But uh, at the MP level, uh, most guys would hang out at the MP club at night. And you were up probably at 6 in the morning and whatever. But going back to... Uh, the bunkers and the rest. The CID people, we always had our weapons with us, whether we were in church or in the MP club or whatever. I always had a 45 or a 38 under my fatigue shirt, but uh, probably twice a week at two, in the, two or three in the morning, the Viet Cong would lob two or three mortar shells in. The sirens would go off. You'd have to go out and get in the bunker. The bunkers were, I was there in 68, 69. The bunkers were probably 10 years old. by No, not five years old by that time. Sandbags on top of, you could stick your finger through them, number one. And after a while, the chances of being hit by a mortar round at the base camp were one in 10 million. So you wouldn't even get out of you wouldn't even get out of your bunk. You just, but it it woke you up, and you'd feel the concussion from the mortar around and all the rest. Once in a while, you'd get some people get through and get into camp, and then you'd hear some shooting and the rest because the uh, the regular troops had their weapons under lock and key in the bunkers. So either a sergeant or an officer had to unlock them and issue the ammo and all the rest. But And then you'd hear some MPs who would usually have their 45s. They'd be, the tents had a concrete floor. You'd hear a 45 go off, they're shooting rats. The rats were as big as, as, big as a dog. I mean, huge rats. And obviously you're not supposed to do that, but... Uh, you you have that happen. So, and it was funny because, oh, I don't know, maybe two miles from our base camp at most. I don't know how far a mortar round can go, but there was a Salada tea plantation, huge plantation, maybe two miles square. French owned, I think, at that time, but the Viet Cong were in there. And that's where they fire their mortars from. Our, I'd go down into the, our MP bunker, and there was a radio in there. And you'd hear the Cobra pilots calling in. We had equipment that could tell you where the mortar round was coming from. And then we couldn't shoot in there. You could not fire any rounds in there. You couldn't fire rockets in there or, or strafe it or bomb it or whatever. It was off limits. So that's part of the way you lose a war, I guess. But Did you ever have any USO shows or entertainers come to your base? Not tech. Bob Hope was supposed to. In fact, I missed out on this opportunity. He was supposed to visit our base like I got there in September. He was supposed to come in, as I recall, around Christmas with his group. And then I was put in charge of security for it. So I had a number of MPs and I was going to welcome them when they flew in and this, that, and all the rest of it. And then they canceled out. But you did have different uh, uh, groups coming around. Some American, a lot of Australian, uh, you know, bands and that type of stuff. And you said you also had donut dollies on your base. Were they always there? Yeah. Yep. Yep. They were there for counseling. Uh, some of them were there for more than that. And we had to arrest a couple of them and ship them off. But, uh, yeah, they were Red Cross uh, donut dollies. And about four or five miles from us, there was a big... Air Force Base, and the Army had a hospital there, too. 
So you mentioned, were we in need of any types of equipment, this, that, and all the rest. It was all relative. I, I can remember taking a brand new top for a Jeep, a canvas top, and trading it for a set of Air Force camouflage fatigues, or taking a pair of new combat boots and trading it with somebody in the Air Force for an M14 that was supposedly off the books and the rest of it. So it's, I had, troops are supposed to carry only the weapons which they're issued uh, because of the ammunition involved, this, that, and all the rest of it. So we would get calls from a company command, especially when the grunts came in from out in the field. They'd come back in with all kinds of weapons, captured weapons, this, that, and the rest of it. But so I'd get a call or my office would get a call from Company B of the 3rd Brigade. Uh, we've got somebody with a Thompson submachine gun and somebody with a 12-gauge uh, shotgun. Pick them up. So I'd pick those up. My locker was full of weapons. I had, unless you're into guns, you wouldn't appreciate, but I probably had 20 different types of weapons. When I shipped out, I left them to one of the guys in the tent, and I know he sold them. There's, he was the type of guy who would, I won't mention his name, but uh, he was from Hamden, Connecticut. And, uh, but, and the same, you're only supposed to have a certain type of knife, whether it's a bayonet or a survival knife. You know, I, I'm not going to take those from the troops. My God, what are you going to do? But, uh, yeah, so I left all that stuff. But, anyways. Did you have any leave while you were over there? Yeah, I went to uh, Bangkok. For how long? Uh, I don't know, seven days maybe, seven, eight days. And when to while you were in Bangkok? I can't say. Oh. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you had a good time and you went back to... Yeah, I waited till I was... <clears throat> I wanted to go... I could have gone with... It's amazing what even regular army personnel don't know about CID back then. We didn't wear rank. I had a fatigue uniform. All I had on my collar was U.S. No rank showed whatsoever. And like I said, down in Saigon, my, my friend Bill Buck, civilian clothes. So I'm thinking full bird colonels knew what the ranks were. Mostly it was warrant officers. That was the, M, whatever you call it, military occupant, MOS for CID. But captains would salute me, even majors sometimes, because they didn't know what rank I was. And we were called Mr. In other words, if I went out to investigate something, I would say, I'm Mr. Metro from CID, show my ID, and go from there. But, uh, so, it was... Well, what else can you tell me about CID? Because most people don't know. And even, like you say, servicemen don't know. What they yeah, know. yeah. It was a, a career field, so to speak, relatively few, uh, and again, they were the detectives of, of the military. And in the Navy, they're called NCIS, like you see on TV. Did they usually pick lawyers? Um, no, nope, nope. They would be, the only reason why they allowed lawyers in during Vietnam is they didn't have enough CID people. And uh, some of the guys, we had a couple, Stanton, Mr. Stanton was when I first got there, and then Miller. Uh, they were career people who probably had some college education, but uh, that was just the way it was. And I don't know what they're doing now. In fact, I don't even think the CID school is uh, uh, at Fort Gordon anymore. I read a little bit of uh, Lee Childs, Jack Reacher novels. 
you know, adventure, shoot them up. And Jack Reacher is a former CID major. We didn't have majors. You had the MP companies had your regular officers. CID was all all warrant officers. And but I think there's I think they're the uh, headquarters of the school is up around Washington now, Virginia or Washington. So, but uh, yeah, no, people didn't know. And that was a long time ago, though. Uh, you know, we're talking 40 years plus. But Who was your commanding officer? Who did you report to? To, the, like I say, there were three. Technically, the colonel was in charge of everything, but CID was sort of separate. Uh, but I don't know the ranking of warrant officers, but it, the two, two different ones while I was there. Uh, were what, what's your opinion of the officer? Like anything. The, I had a couple friends who were captains who flew uh, Cobra gunships. And I didn't get caught, but they take me up in a Cobra and let me sit in the gunner seat up front. I wouldn't do that today, believe me, but when you're 25 years old and the rest of it, I remember one uh, chopper pilot, a gunner, I mean a chopper pilot, a captain too, he'd come to our MP club and it, it was scary when you think about it now, but he could take a fifth of vodka and drink, chug it down like a beer. I mean, most people would be dead. It's, uh, and then fly? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. But, uh, no, so the office, it's, it's like anything else. The, you gravitate to the people with the same interests. Uh, but I had a lot of friends with, who were MPs, and we were good friends. Uh, and you'll see some of the slides if you get a chance where there's guys standing around the trailer or standing around a table with a beer in hand and the rest of it. But beer was 10 cents a can, I think. Uh, back then I was naive. I didn't drink much hard stuff, but uh, that was comparably low price that you could Do you recall your last days in Vietnam? Vividly. I was, uh, I was down with a, I was down at uh, Cameron Bay, laid over for three or four, five days maybe, and I ran into a captain again, who had been on the flight over from the United States when I came in country back in, in 60, uh, 68. And I ran into him. So he said, uh, Jim, be my guest tonight. Meet me at the officer's club. And I had the fatigues on with no rank. So he said, meet me at the officer's club. So I met him there. And we're inside. It, it was packed. It was really crowded. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a general comes in, and he was mingling with the people and the officers and the rest, and he sees me, and he comes over, and he says, Soldier, don't you salute? So I got up, saluted. What's your rank? I said, Sir, I'm CID. I don't have rank. I asked you what your... I said, Sir... I'm CID. What are you doing in this club? I said, Captain Smith is my buddy, and we came over together, and we're going home together. You report to my office tomorrow. So he said, you may not be going home. <laughs> so I said, uh oh. So the next day I got up, I went over to his office, and... He had a female assistant, a whack, I guess whack, but uh, he comes out and he starts giving me hell. Oh, I'm going to check with CID. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. 
So he said, you're not going home. I said, sir, I'm due to go home two days from now or whatever. Well, you're not, you're staying here. So I said, can I use your phone? And the whack looked at him and he nodded. So I said, I'd like to call Senator Abe Ribikoff's office in Washington. And this story I tell when I used to go out and speak to people and guys I know. But anyways, and the phone service was, you know, there was a difference uh, with the international dateline and all that, but time difference, day difference. But uh, as it turns out, she was able to get through. So I'm standing there now. And <laughs> she asked me the phone. And there was a woman on, on the line, good morning. And I said, this is all concocted now by me. Mary, it's Jim, is Uncle Abe there? And the general standing there and the whack is sitting here. I said, oh, he's not there. Well, could you tell him to call uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara? I'm ready to come home in a couple of days and there's a general here who's not letting me come home. And I must have had, you know, more nerve than I have now. I said, General, what's your name again? So I <laughs> get out of here, soldier. And that was that. But that was my last two or three days. Well, it was pretty fast thinking on your part. I was smarter than I think, but it was. But, but she actually got a really cost office? Yeah, yeah. Yep, they actually called it through and and I didn't let the woman Talk. I mean, I just said, uh, and I think I said Mary, it could have been anything, but <laughs> Mary, it's Jim. Is Uncle Abe around? <laughs> oh, oh. So you left Vietnam with a schedule. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yep. And that was the end of it. And I'm sure, uh, well, Abe is, uh, I was involved in politics afterwards, but. Uh, did you ever tell Abe what happened with the story? No, I never did. And he used to live in, well, he lived in Warren. But he and his wife uh, used to be down at the general store in, in Cornwall Bridge all the time. Where did you arrive when you came back to the United States? Uh, I, I flew into, we flew into Okinawa, stayed there a couple days. And, oh, going back to my trip over, I had stated that I flew from Oakland to Vietnam, but I, we flew from Oakland to uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and stayed probably four days in Anchorage with our jungle fatigues now. And you had your duffel bag and all that. But uh, so we were there a few days. Coming back, I flew into uh, Okinawa first. I don't know if we laid over there for a day or two or not, but um, then we flew into Fort Lewis, Washington. And CID, I called the CID office at Fort Lewis. They sent a car over, picked me up, took me to CID barracks. I stayed there a couple of days and then came home. Were you discharged from Fort Lewis? Uh, technically, I wasn't discharged for maybe a couple of weeks after that. I came home in uniform, and then if you were in if you were in Vietnam, even though you were a draftee, you didn't have any reserve obligation, so on and so forth. Uh, so, so then I got my discharge papers maybe a couple weeks after that. What did you do in the uh, first days and weeks you were home from Vietnam? Well, my mother and father, my wife picked me up. And my uh, father stopped at a Catholic church, and, and I'm Catholic, as it was my whole family, but we had to stop and pray. And that was the first thing he did. Uh, then we got home, and my wife 
was uh, my ex-wife was living with her parents while I was gone. So we went to my parents' house and went down into the family room. And all my memora Yankee memorabilia. I was a big Mickey, Mickey Mantle fan. My brother was a Willie Mays fan, but I was Mickey Mantle. I had every magazine about Mickey Mantle from when he came up in 1951 to when he retired in 60, whatever. I had all kinds of memorabilia. My father had thrown it all away. And to the day he died, he would never own up to it. I think he was just afraid that it wasn't coming back. Get rid of all, I had baseball uniforms. I always wore number seven. He threw those away. He, oh, so yeah, it was <laughs> interesting. And some of the Mickey Mantle stuff, the ba original his rookie year card, $25,000, uh, but he would never, in fact, my present wife, Sue, would say, Pop, you know how much, and he would just, he'd get real angry, he'd get really upset, but uh, that's the only thing we could figure, that he just wanted everything gone before, you know, he got word that I wasn't coming back. What did you do for work then when you got back? Did you start practicing law? Uh, not right away. I, I had to decide what type of law I wanted to go into. You know, you change after a couple of years in the military. So I think I collected unemployment <laughs> for, uh, for probably two months. And I applied to different law firms. Uh, I was thinking when I got out of law school. I, I liked labor law. It was one of the areas of the law that I enjoyed, but I just changed. I wanted to go into private practice, and I interviewed with a couple lawyers up in this area, and I went in with a sole practitioner, Frank Dooley, uh, and he and I were partners for, well, I was an associate for probably six years, and then we were partners, and then uh, Governor O'Neill, Billy O'Neill, was a good friend of mine when I was in the legislature. He appointed me as a workers' comp commissioner uh, back in 89. So I was in private practice for probably 16 or 17 years. And Frank's still a good friend of mine. He's older. He's probably mid-80s now. But uh, So that's the story. Yeah. Did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? Yes, but like anything else, they slide. Uh, I st Danny, uh, no, I'm not going to mention his name because he's the guy who would have sold the weapons, but Artie Simmerling was our club manager. Uh, Bill Buck and Terry Dalton went through CID school with me. Uh, so they're, you know, some of them I keep in touch. I'll drop them a Christmas card or so whatever. You stay, you stay yeah, yeah, home. you stay in touch. Do you have any reunions? No, not as, although one of my, uh, I belong to the uh, American Legion here in town in the VFW up in, uh, up in Canaan, but I think it's the Legion puts out a monthly magazine and in the back they'll have, I think the Navy has more reunions because obviously you're, if you're stationed on a ship with guys for months or years on end, you're going to be much closer, but I did see a while ago, probably a year ago, where former CID agents were having a convention, and I was going to write to the address and just find out uh, what was going on, but I never did, but, uh, but that's about as close as a reunion. How did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, I could tell other stories about, put it this way, we could have won that war. There's no doubt, even though I wasn't a general, or <laughs> we could have won the war. I just don't like the way we fight wars now. I mean, I hate war. It's, you know, everybody thinks that because certain individuals are conservative or 
because they promote this or, but you've got to do what you've got to do. And I could go into more detail about what we could have done over, at least at my level and whatever. But uh, no, I've, I've always been conservative. Uh, still, although I was in the legislature as a Democrat and uh, I won't go into politics, but, uh, yeah. you know, it's... Uh, How would you say that your military service affected your life? I don't know. I I don't think... I, I'm not an introspective person. Uh, when I think back, I enjoyed the time I spent in the military. I enjoyed a lot of the people I met. Uh, a lot of friends, um, had some good times, had some scary times, but uh, I don't know if it did affect me. I don't have nightmares and the rest. Uh, I don't think I suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, but uh, there are a lot of guys who did and a lot of guys now. I mean, it's... but. Jim, is there anything else that you would like to add or any other memorable stories that we haven't discussed already? No, no. I think you, you've done a good job with the questionnaire and with your questions. So it gives you uh, at least perspective uh, from my experiences as to... Well, I'd like to thank you for your service. Oh, thank you for this interview. quite all right. <laughs>